effect on November 30th, which I don't know how you guys are. November seems to me to be far away. And then I think, oh my goodness, it's September. <laughs> so it's really not that far away. Hey, Sam, good to see you on here. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, so these will, will start, uh, you know, here just in a couple of months. And there's something that's a really big deal called a limited content message. I think more accurately should be called a limited content voicemail. We'll see why. And uh, let me share with you a, a real quick story that I think will will uh, maybe be slightly amusing to you now. And definitely as we go through this, I think this will help us to keep in mind what's going to happen. So this was years and years ago, and I can't remember if I've ever told this story, but I, I get a message from either my secretary or receptionist saying, hey, there's a lawyer from another city that needs your help filing an FDCPA case. And at the time, I was really mainly doing Fair Credit Reporting Act cases, but I said, sure, I'll talk to a lawyer because we get a lot of our business from lawyers. They refer us cases. And so I'm talking to this guy and he said, uh, you know, I'm a collection lawyer. I thought, that's kind of strange. Why are you calling me? And he said, I want to sue this other collection lawyer. Like, <laughs> you know, you definitely have my interest here. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I've got this huge client. I think it was a hospital or something. And and you guys that are on here, I think you're familiar with the FTCPA. When you get that first communication or within five days of first communication, they have to send you what's called the 1692G validation letter that says, basically, we'll assume this debt's valid unless we hear from you in 30 days. Okay. And so uh, this young collection lawyer went to the older lawyer's client and said, you know, that guy, he gives them 30 days. I'm only going to give them 14 days. And they, they took all the business from the older lawyer and gave it to the younger lawyer. It's just flagrantly violating the law. And I share that with you to say, there's always going to be among certain collectors, this idea that I'm going to break the law to hurt consumers. And I'm going to break the law to get an advantage over my competition. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this limited content message or limited uh, content voicemail, because this is a major, major new rule coming into play. It's going to really fundamentally alter collection, but we're going to see where collectors can start to cut corners here. And let's see, uh, Eric says, uh, that's just a great business. <laughs> yeah, it was, except, you know, the, the guy would get sued, not by another collection lawyer, but uh, and we'll even see uh, in the what the FDCPA says about this. I know Eric's joking about that. I mean, it is a good business move. It just happens to be illegal. And Maria says uh, dealing with one right now. So let's talk about before we sort of look forward, you know, to this new rule, let's take a step back and say, what's been the rule for a long time? And we covered this not last week, but the last webinar we did where you remember it, those of you that were on here, maybe you saw the replay. We're going through asking some examples like, what if they leave a voicemail? And what if somebody overhears the voicemail? You know, is that a violation? Is it not a violation? And so basically the law is if you leave a voicemail, you have to say, this is from a debt collector. I'm attempting to collect a debt. But if a third party overhears it, in other words, somebody other than the consumer or the consumer spouse, now the debt collectors violate the law. So what do they do? So this leads us to a case called Edwards versus Niagara. And this is out of, I think it started in Georgia. It's from the 11th Circuit, which is the federal court over Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. And I want you to see this. And I realize some of you, you know, may just be on your phone or driving and listening. Uh, so I can definitely get this to you later. Uh, but this is just a PDF of the actual court decision. I just want to look at it very briefly, and then we'll get into exactly what this new rule says. But we kind of have to know where we're coming from to now understand where we're trying to go. And so let me switch here and get this up on the screen. So, and again, if you're not in a position where you can uh, get this PDF, just respond to one of those automated emails and say, hey, John, I need the 
the Edwards versus Niagara case. So here's the very short version of this. We won't look at the whole thing, but this first paragraph is important. And I just want to read part of this. It says, in an oft-repeated statement from the Vietnam War, an unidentified American military officer supposedly said, we had to destroy the village to save it. And obviously, it's kind of a weird way of putting it. And the 11th Circuit said, well, here's what this debt collector is saying. Offers up much the same logic to explain why it violated the FDCPA. It was necessary to violate the act in order to comply with the act. So sort of wrap your mind around that has to do with these voicemail messages. So what happened here? So we've got this collector. By the way, this is a decision from 2009. So, and this was not new law then, okay? So it's long been the law of what we're looking at. And uh, if you see here in the highlighted part on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, here's the message. This is an important message for the the consumer, please return this message at this phone number between these hours. It's important you reach this office. And so they had a policy of, uh, you know, providing the phone number, the real name, all that stuff. But they purposely left out any information disclosing they were from Niagara Credit Solutions or a debt collector or that the call had been made for the purpose of collecting a debt. And then the 11th Circuit points out under Section 1692E11 that if you're a debt collector, any communication, you have to say, hey, this is from a debt collector. Well, they chose not to do that because they were afraid that it would risk violating another provision, which prohibits an agency from communicating about the debt with a third party. And again, we looked at this in the last webinar, this sort of, you know, there's danger in leaving a voicemail. Either you don't adequately disclose it's from a debt collector or you do that, but maybe a third party overhears it. And so this is what this debt collector decided to do. They say, Hey, we're going to, you know, break the law. Okay. By violating E11. So we don't break the law by violating CB. Okay. The, the idea of third party. So we won't go through all this, but I just want you to see this last part here. Niagara complains that if it is not permitted to leave out of its answering machine messages, the disclosure required by E11, that's the thing it says, I'm a debt collector, it's attempt to collect a debt. The result will be it cannot leave any messages on answering machines. And they say, well, you're assuming this will be a third party disclosure. Somebody hears it, we're not deciding that. They say, but even if you're correct about that, the answer is the act, the FDCPA, does not guarantee a debt collector the right to leave answering machine messages. So they're like, you don't have any right to do this. If you do it, you better comply with the law, all of the law, okay? So that's really all we're going to look at with uh, that case. Now let's go back to uh, our slides here. So th this is, you can imagine, debt collectors are just like having a come apart. There's a Southern expression for those of you not from the South. They're just having this meltdown over, what do we do? We, we violate the law or we violate the law and, and this is so unfair, we can't leave voicemail messages. So the CFPB said, we're totally redoing things and we're going to give you this, this protection here, this permission to do a limited content voicemail. So what we want to do is look at the rule and then we want to uh, see, well, how are they going to violate this law? Okay, I expect there will be violations of the law starting November 30, 2021. OK, so uh, I tell you what, let me actually share with you. Uh, let's see. I think I've got one more thing for you here. If I can find it here. Well, maybe I don't have it. Um, yeah, I thought I had the link to um, this law. I tell you what, let me just show this to you real quick. And uh, I'll drop this into the chat. So this is the actual section that we're going to be dealing with. And again, if you're driving or not in a position to get this, don't worry about it. We'll, uh, you can always email me about it. But this is from the CFPB. And this is the, there's more to it than this, but this is the definitions. And the reason we're focusing on the definitions is they define what is known as a limited content message. And if you're not familiar with how uh, 
uh, the CFPB puts this stuff, they will put the really the law right here. And then they'll say, well, here's some interpretation. And you can just click the little plus button and that will expand it. It gives you kind of their thought process, maybe some examples. And so that can be helpful. And uh, so we're not necessarily going to look at those examples. We'll just kind of talk about some. But let's go back to the presentation. So here's the rule. All right. And what I want us to do, and I realize there may be, you know, only a, a few people that are uh, sitting at a computer or can type into the chat. So if this doesn't work, you know, uh, it, it's fine. But what I'd like to do is go through this and just ask you guys some questions and have you type into the chat. And, and let's just think about this together. OK, so limited content message means a voicemail message for a consumer that includes all of the content described in the, the next paragraph that may include any of the content described in the following paragraph, and that includes no other content. So here's what I want you to think about. What about a text message? What if a debt collector says, man, I love this idea. Oh, and by the way, let me just say that the reason this is called a limited content, it's considered not a collection uh, type communication. And so they don't have to give the disclosures. And if a third party overheard it, it would, would not be a third party disclosure. That's kind of the theory behind it, that you can safely leave this message. And so what if a debt collector says, hey, I love this idea and uh, I want to do this in a text message or I want to send a limited content email? Just from looking at this definition, do you think that that would be allowable under this rule to send a limited content text message or email, or maybe to call somebody and only give them a limited content message, would that be allowable under this rule? And so I'll give you just a moment there. And again, I know a lot of times people reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm driving or I'm not in a position where I can type in. So it's no problem. But if you are, just give me your thoughts on whether you think that would be appropriate or not under this rule to leave maybe a text message, a voicemail, or even just a to have a conversation with somebody. And let's see, I'm not seeing, okay, so Eric says, uh, no, that would not be appropriate, okay? Yeah, and I think that that's right, because if we look at what it says here in red, we're talking about a voicemail message. So a limited content message means a voicemail message. If it meant text or phone call or, you know, have a sign behind a plane flying over the beach, like whatever it is, they would have told us that. And actually the CFPB proposed that it would be broader than a voicemail message, but the final rule is just limited to a voicemail message. So yeah, and Anthony says same thing. So you know, it, it's a voicemail. It, yeah, and Jeff says a strict interpretation of voicemail is not a text. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Jeff. So, you know, a, a text is a text, a voicemail is a voicemail. And so this has to be a voicemail. So just the starting point, and this is what, you know, I do as a lawyer and what you guys can do if you get one of these yourself is, you know, you say, okay, is this that new limited, you know, uh, content message? And say, well, no, because it's not a voicemail. It was a text. It was an email of something else. Okay. So what we're talking about today, strictly limited to voicemails. Okay. So it's a voicemail message for a consumer. So here's my question. What if I'm the debt collector and we'll take Jeff, for example, and, and I know what Jeff's phone number is. And I know that Eric is Jeff's neighbor. And so I leave a voicemail message for the neighbor, Eric, and, and, and put this on it. Would that qualify as a limited content message if I leave that for a third party, a neighbor, as opposed to leaving it for the consumer? Yeah, and Tony says no. That's right. It, because we just go strictly by what is said here. It's a voicemail message for a consumer. So if the debt collector is leaving it for a third party, in other words, anybody other than the consumer or consumer spouse, it's not a limited content message, okay? Now, if a third party just happens to overhear it, that's different. But if, if 
the debt collector knows they're leaving it on a, a voicemail or answering machine that's not belonging to the consumer, then they've got a problem. Yes, yeah, so everybody's saying, you know, that's, that would not be correct. So then it has to include all of the content described in the next paragraph, which will be our next slide. And then it may include some of this optional content, and then it includes no other content. So let's just think about that. If somebody says, well, you know, I want to include half of what's required because I think it'll be more effective. Well, then that wouldn't qualify as a limited content message where they say, you know, I'm going to put all the requirements and I'm going to put all the optional. And then I got a few extra things I want to add because, boy, that will really you know, trigger the phone calls that will get the money flowing in. They may be right, but that would violate the law. So this is how we go through a statute. You just say, okay, these words have meaning. And let's take just the plain meaning, you know, not some weird interpretation, but just like, okay, limited content message means a voicemail. Me All right, that's pretty clear. For a consumer, not for anybody else, that includes all of the content described, which we'll see on the next slide. And then you can have some of this optional content and no other content. And so if a debt collector puts additional content, they don't get this protection. And let's see, Johnny says, uh, maybe off subject a little bit, but the limited content message, it would be included in a no contact order. Is that correct? So um, as far as a no contact order, I'm assuming you're talking about like a cease and desist letter, refuse to um, uh, pay type letter then, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, if that's what we're talking about, um, would, would they still be able to leave this? My view is no. Now, I'm still sort of going through this. I mean, the sort of the official interpretation of this is uh, I was going to print off and it's like 635 pages. And so, uh, the, you know, that's a, a, to me, an open question. It may be described in there. I'm not sure. But I would take the view that if you have a cease and desist or a refuse to pay, which is the same thing, uh, then they should not be even leaving these on, on your voicemail. And uh, Tony says, <laughs> I think half the content's fine for DC. Yeah, and uh, let's see, Maria having some connection issues. And uh, so hopefully those will get cleared up and uh, hopefully it's not um, on my end here. So uh, try to, you know, plug in ethernet, everything. So this will hopefully be as stable as possible. So it, this is the required content. Okay. This is what you have to have. There's really four things and let's just go through them quickly. And then we'll, we'll just sort of think about them together. So number one, a business name for the debt collector that does not indicate the debt collectors in the debt collection business. So that's number one, you have to include that. Number two, a request that the consumer reply to the message. You have to have that. Number three, the name or names of one or more natural persons whom the consumer can contact to reply. And then number four, a telephone number or numbers the consumer can use to reply. So if they say, well, you know what? I love the idea of, uh, hey, consumer, reply to me, and this is Bob Smith, and here's phone number, but I'm not going to leave my business name. Okay, you can do that, but it's not a limited content message, okay? So why would a company not want to leave their name? Well, look at that very first one, a business name for the debt collector that does not indicate the debt collectors in the debt collection business. So uh, think about some collection agencies maybe you've dealt with personally, you've read about, you've heard about that you think might violate this law, okay? And, and I'll just throw one out, you know, just sort of make it up, you know, XYZ collection agency. Well, obviously that would not comply with this section one, because that name does indicate the collector is in the business of collecting debt. And so if they left that name, say, hey, this is XYZ debt collector. My name is John Watts. Uh, I you know really appreciate you giving me a call back at 1-800, blah, 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 blah. Well, I might think that I'm leaving a limited content message, but that's not a limited content message because all four of these have to be in place. And so by me saying I'm with XYZ Collection Agency, I have revealed that 
we're in the business of collecting debt. So the theory behind this limited content message is it's a message that if somebody overheard, they wouldn't go, ah, oh, I know you're dealing with the debt collector. It's just sort of neutral. It doesn't raise any suspicions. Okay. So yeah, Jeff raises a very interesting point. He says many collection agencies will be changing their name by November 30. Yeah. So let's think that through. So uh, again, you have to leave your business name. And if your business name suggests you're in the debt collection business, then it's, it's not a limited content message. And if it's not a limited content message, then as a practical matter, it's a communication to collect a debt, which means they have to give you the disclosure. Hey, this is a debt collector. We're attempting to collect a debt, which they won't do in a limited content message. So now they violate the law. So Jeff says, you know, uh, they'll just change your name. Well, in some places, that's fairly easy. They might can even do like a DBA, you know, like a doing business as. But in a lot of states, they have to go through all sorts of licensing issues. Uh, they may have to get completely relicensed in a state. There are even some states where down to like the county level or maybe bigger cities, maybe even small cities, you have to, if you're going to be collecting in that area, you have to get a license. There's always money involved when you're getting a license from a government. And so they have to think about this like, well, hey, we really want to leave these limited content messages, but we're going to violate this by the name. But if we change our name, that's going to be a nightmare changing our name. And so we're going to have some that just won't change their name, but they'll give a fake name. And depending on the state, that may be a violation of the law. Okay. And I certainly would argue it is under this because it's not your business name. And, you know, if they don't go through the proper regulatory channels, some states, not all states, but some states will say, if you're not properly licensed, you cannot collect in this state. And any money you've collected, you've got to give back to consumers. So it's going to be a real interesting issue. And uh, Sam says, wow, I'll be listening for sure. <laughs> yeah. It, so I'll tell you this, as a lawyer who sues debt collectors who break the law, uh, you know, there, there are some in the industry that say, oh, this is going to prevent lawsuits. It's going to skyrocket lawsuits because they're going to mess it up and they're going to start leaving lots of voicemail messages. Most debt collectors now do not leave voicemail messages. They're going to start leaving the messages. Consumers are going to come to me and say, hey, can you listen to this? So now it's not a matter of, well, did the consumer really understand the conversation or did they throw away the letter or no, it's here's the voicemail. Just you send it to, to me or to another consumer lawyer. We listen to it, even if it doesn't violate the law. If we're sort of involved, it, so many of these collectors will violate the law. They just can't help themselves. You know, here's the line. And what they do is they say, you know, I, I need to stay over here, but boy, it's so much easier to cross that line and, and we make more money by breaking law. Well, our job is to help change the calculation by pulling some of that money back from them, giving it to consumers. So uh, let's see, Eric says bonding. Yeah, when you start getting into licensing and you have a bond and you have to renew your bond and now you have a government agency looking at you more closely and uh, Maria says, info is awesome. Well, thank you, Maria. Th this is this whole change, and, and we're, we're not even scratching the surface with just this webinar. There'll be more webinars because talking about when can they text you and when can they email you and when can they send you a, a direct message through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever the new social media you know application may be tomorrow. You know, I mean, what if you look down and if you've got a, a signal? Uh, you know, app or uh, what's the other one? The uh, I forget the name, Telegram or whatever it is. Yeah, and all of a sudden there's a message pops up from a debt collector. Hey, I'm collecting this debt. Is that legal? Is it illegal? We're going to talk about that. This is a definitely the biggest change in the FDCPA since it was passed in about 78. So really some important stuff here. All right. So let's look now at the optional content. So they don't have to include this and they can include one of these, two of these, three of these, or four of these. Okay. And they can just pick and choose. So 
It can include a salutation. So you could say, hey, Maria, uh, you know, hope you're having a great day. This is John Watts from, you know, Portfolio Recovery Associates. Although that ought to make you stop and think, hmm, Portfolio Recovery Associates, does that give away that this is a debt collector? I think it does. That would be a problem for portfolio recovery, okay? But you can do a salutation. You can do the date and time. Yeah, you can say, hey, uh, you know, dear uh, Sam, uh, you know, I'm leaving you this message at, uh, you know, 127 Central Time on September 2nd. And um, hey, this is number three. You know, it'd be great if you could call me back between four and seven Central Time. Uh, that'll be wonderful. Um, and then the final thing is you can say, but look, you don't have to just speak with me. You can speak with anybody. Okay, so let's just go through that again. You can have a salutation, you know, you can say, dear so-and-so. You can have a date and time of the message. You can suggest, you can't require, but you can suggest sometimes for the consumer to call back. And you can say, look, you don't have to speak with me because remember, I have to give my name. Let's go back to, uh, you know, we've got a business name and then the name or names of one or more natural persons. OK, so they have to do that. So an optional thing is you can say, but look, you can talk to any of our representatives, any of our associates, and they'll be glad to help you. So you can do that. All right. Let's see, uh, Eric. It says, how do they determine the phone number is able to have limited content messages? So name on the phone account isn't your name. Is that an immediate third-party disclosure regardless of the voicemail content? So it would depend, Eric. If, if they call and the, you know, so let's say it's your phone, Eric, and, um, you know, the voicemail says, hey, thanks for reaching me. This is Maria. You know, please leave your name and number at the tone. Well, then they would have to be really, really confident. This is my view. They'd have to be really confident, Eric, that that's actually your phone, even though you have a different name on it, uh, because otherwise they're not leaving it for the consumer. So if we go back to the requirements, it's, well, let's see, let's back up even one more. It's for a consumer, okay? But if they're purposely leaving that on somebody else's phone, then that's going to be a problem for them. And they don't even get to, you know, the next screen, which are the requirements or the optional content. And so great question, great question. So if we start to put all this together, say, okay, it's gotta be a voicemail. It's gotta be for the consumer. You have to list all these things that these four requirements here. And so it's a business name that does not indicate you're in the debt collection. Hey, consumer, please reply. Here's a name of a natural person. Now, one question is going to be, does it have to be a real name or can it be a fake name? So there's a lot of things that, you know, be interesting to see how they play out. Some of these, the CFPB has addressed, some will be addressed by the courts. And then a telephone number. So, you know, if they say this is um, Smith Industries calling and we'd like you to call back. And my name is John Watts. And look forward to hearing from you. That's not a limited content because number four, have to provide a telephone number. What if I say, now, um, you know, just just uh, call me back on the number I called you from. That That's fine. Just, you know, hit redial and, and it'll be great. I don't think that works because it says you must provide a telephone number, not, well, by the way, try to dig through and figure out what number I called you from. Okay. So, you know, the, the name, well, again, what if they just make up a name? There's nobody named Susie Smith and, you know, that's just a fake person. They say, well, this is Susie Smith. It's really not Susie Smith leaving that. I think that's a problem. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the person's voice, you know, that match to the name, but there has to be a natural person or persons that you can, can uh, contact. And so, uh, we just have to go through this in sort of a very mechanical way and say, you know, was it a voicemail? Was it for the consumer? Does it have the business name, request, uh, one or more natural persons, the phone number? If any of those things are missing, it's not a limited content message. And it likely will then violate 
that section E11, you know, this is a debt collector. I'm attempting to collect the debt. And if it is overheard by somebody else and it's not a limited content message, it may be a third party disclosure. So we just have to go through these, you know, pretty carefully. Uh, Jeff says it would be a lie and they can't lie, right? Yeah, generally any lying is going to violate the FTCPA. I think we talked about that, uh, I guess, two weeks ago. That's at Section E, which is any type of deception. Now, there's been some case law over the years about, you know, do you have to use your real name? Can you use like a, um, what's a fancy word? Pseudoname, you know, so I think that, <laughs> or else that's for sinuses. I guess that's Sudafed. Um but the, the point is, you know, that some courts will allow them to, you know, maybe not give their full name. Uh, we'll just have to see how this plays out here. But when it's just a flat out lie, you know, then that's going to be definitely a problem for them. All right. So, again, this optional content, they can do this, but nothing else. So you've got this and you've got that. All right. So there's four requirements. And then there are four possible or optional things. Anything besides that, they violated the law, okay? So if they leave off one of those requirements, they violate the law. If they add stuff that's not allowed, they violate the law. So let's think about this uh, sort of overreaching here. So you have a debt collector that says, yeah, I want to leave a limited content message, but I'm just going to do it as a... Uh, as a uh, um, not as a voicemail, actually, I wrote that wrong, as a, you know, a text message, or uh, I'm going to, you know, leave this limited content voicemail, but the person actually answers, and so I just go ahead and tell them. I can't do that, okay? So it has to be a, uh, a you know, you have to follow these rules. And so uh, in looking at what I have on bullet point number two is, and I'm sorry, you know, bullet point, this sort of the conversation in their head. You know, I'm going to leave this voicemail, but number two, I'm going to add some things. Well, then you violated the law. Or I'm going to leave off my business name, but I still want this limited. Con no, that doesn't work. Okay. Or I'm going to leave these for the mother-in-law. Or, oh, here's a list of references when you took out this loan or you leased this, you know, TV or a bedroom suit or whatever. I'm going to leave these messages on all those. No, that's not limited content message. And so this is what, you know, if you go back to our, what we started off with that collection lawyer calling me saying this other guy's, you know, stole all my business. Look at the purpose of the FDCPA eliminate abusive debt collection practices by debt. Collect. Well, that makes sense, right? It's the fair debt collection practices act. But look at this other one, to ensure that those debt collectors who refrain, in other words, they don't use abusive debt collection practices, are not competitively disadvantaged. So I was doing a closing argument in federal court one time to a jury where we sued a debt collector, and this was exactly what my argument was. I said, look, they broke the law, and you know, I think you should find that that damaged my client, but I also want you to think about how unfair that is to the honorable debt collectors out there, the guys and gals that are following the law, the companies that are being, you know, very strict compliance and making sure they're not cutting corners. And then you have this collection agency that's like, we don't care about that. Our job is to get the money by any means necessary. And how unfair that is to debt collectors who are staying within the bounds of the law. You know, when, when football season happens, we can have 11 players on the field. Well, what if the other team says, our job is to score a touchdown. We're putting 13 guys on the field. Well, you cheated and you get penalized for that. Same thing here. So these guys, if we go back to one of, uh, I think it was Eric's comment, you know, we, great business strategy to, you know, <laughs> kind of go get all the business by saying, we're going to be more aggressive than the collectors that follow the law. Well, the FTCPA acknowledges that and says, no, no, no. This is what the FDCPA is designed to stop here. So let's see, Jeff says, what if they leave a reference number or an account number? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Jeff. Let's go back and, and look at this. So here's what they have to say. You know, and let, let's just kind of play this out. So I'm going to be the debt collector. And, and Jeff, you're the, the consumer here. I say, um, 
Well, I tell you what, we'll actually start with this. So I can put a salutation date and time. Okay. And so I say, uh, dear Jeff, you know, or, or hey, Jeff, this is John Watts. I'm with Smith Industries. Uh, I'd really like you to uh, call me back. Um, you know, here's a phone number. You can reach me and uh, just put in, um, you know, write this down. It's reference number one, two, three, four or account number six, seven, eight, nine. And, uh, you know, anybody can help you here. And um, if you can, we'd love for you to call back between 2 and 8 p.m. Central Time, uh, Monday through Saturday. Thank you very much. Yeah, Tony said that's a violation. There's nowhere in that required content that says they can leave an account number or a reference number. And then when we go to the optional content, we don't see it there. So it, it's a very good question there by Jeff, because this is so natural. You know, they're like, uh, you know, your reference number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, I can't do that <laughs> if they're leaving a limited content message. Now, they may say, but that doesn't make sense. We ought to be able to do that. My reading of this, and ultimately, you know, we're going to get the judges that will, you know, start writing opinions. But my view is to leave a reference number, an account number, uh, anything like that would violate this. In other words, it makes this not a limited content message. If it's not a limited content message, then they have to give you the disclosure. Hey, we're a debt collector. We're attempting to collect a debt. If they don't do that, they violate the law. If they do that, well, then it's not a limited content message. Okay. So, you know, th this is stuff that is going to be litigated. And again, we're going to find, you know, there's going to be some collector that says, well, we did a split test, you know, an AB split test or half of them. We did this way, half this way. And when we put the reference number or we say, you must call us back within 48 hours. Well, let's see. Suggested dates and times, not you must call me back. You know, if we don't hear from you, uh, you can imagine the consequence. Well, I don't see that in here. <laughs> okay. So that's a big, big problem for them. And I'm just telling you, they almost cannot help themselves. They must violate the law. And, you know, I've told this story before. This is, I don't know, a, a, uh, Aesop's fables, you know, the, the uh, scorpion and the frog and the scorpion says to the frog, let me get on your back and you swim us across the river and we'll, you know, we'll be safe. And the frog's like, you're going to sting me. He's like, why would I do that? If I sting you, you'll die and I'll die. And the frog's like, makes sense to me. Get on my back, swimming across, scorpion stings the frog and the frog is dying. And it's like, what are you doing? Why did you do that? You're going to die too. And the scorpion's like, that's what we do. Well, abusive debt collectors are abusive. Abusive debt collectors break the law. It's just what they do. It's almost when they're presented with a choice, follow the law, don't follow the law. Even if it doesn't make them more money, they're like, eh, let's break the law. It's just, it's a habit. You know, what do we call it? Being, uh, you know, habitual. This is something they just, they're so used to breaking the law. And it's also this idea that we can outsmart everybody. You know, everybody else is going to do this, you know, the four requirements and the four optional we're smarter. We figured out a way to slip something else in there and get a better return, make more money. And consumers are not smart enough to catch on to this and sue us. And that's where it's going to be really, really interesting because what I hope is that consumers will be aware of this and you guys are aware of it. Let other people know about this. And, and, and so when they get a voicemail message, instead of just saying, Oh my goodness, how annoying this voicemail. Let me delete it. It's like, you know what? Let me listen to it. Let me send it to a consumer lawyer. And then, you know, a lot of times if we get involved early, you know, we catch them violating the law. If not on this, then it'll be something else. Maybe it'll be on the credit reporting. You know, we say, hey, send a dispute letter. And then the credit, uh, the, the collector updates your credit report and they don't mark it as dispute. Boom. Those are great cases, you know? And I mean, they're thousands of dollars and killing the debt, deleting the debt. It's good stuff, you know? And so it, this will, I think, bring more consumers to consumer lawyers, which will ultimately help consumers because we don't charge anything for this. I mean, we get our money when we sue and we get that out of the bad guys. So 
Uh, let's see. Tony says, seems like you're going to be very busy. See, yeah, I think so. I mean, this is the last time there was a change this big was 2014, January of 2014. We had what, you know, they're not new anymore, but we still call them the new RESPA rules, R-E-S-P-A. This has to do with mortgage servicing. And that was a big deal, uh, but uh, not nearly as big as this. And and look, I hope everybody on this call is doing fantastic economically, you know, and you're if you own a house, it's going up in value and you're, you know, fully employed and all that. My strong suspicion is some very challenging times are coming. And so we're going to have these new rules as debt and collection activity will just explode. And these collectors, again, they're going to cut corners. They're going to say, well, you know, it costs us $750,000 to really get in total compliance, change our computer system, do the training. And somebody's like, eh, spend a hundred thousand and let's just get busy bringing in money. Okay. And that's where all of us step in and we sue these guys until it becomes so painful. They go, let's spend the money, do it the right way. So we don't get sued. That's, <laughs> that's the only way they will change. They will not change because they suddenly wake up and go, wow, I want to be a good guy today. No, the, the ones that are honorable, that are following the law, they're going to do it anyway. But the other guys, they're not going to suddenly, you know, have a, a, a moral conscience here. It's only going to be if it costs them more money than they're making. So let's see. Eric says, do they need to state that they're recording the voicemail? So no, uh, the, the reason is because, you know, they're leaving the voicemail on your recording. So obviously, you know, you know, it's being recorded. They know it's being recorded. Uh, now, whether they record it, and typically they do, so it's a very good point. Uh, but the fact that you're allowing a recording is your consent to the other side recording it as well. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let's see, Johnny says, stating that they're recording the voicemail giveaway, what type of business there? Yeah, it might. I mean, I, I guess your local hardware store could say, you know, uh, by the way, we're recording this voicemail. It would seem really weird, right? Nobody in normal life does that. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't leave a voicemail for, for Johnny or Eric and say, and by the way, I'm recording this voicemail. I'm leaving you. That would be very strange. Uh, and and But look, what if they did say it? Well, not sound like a broken record, but it's not a salutation. It's not a date, time, message. not suggested dates and times. It's not a statement you can talk to any other people and it's not one of these requirements. So if they added that, oh, by the way, we're recording this, I would say it's not a limited content message because we go back to the starting point. It's a voicemail message that includes all of the J1. Those are the four things. It may include any of the content in paragraph J2. Those are the four optional and includes no other content. I think saying we're recording it would be other content and that would be a problem for them. So uh, here's the, uh, you know, if you guys have any more questions about this, just let me know. And, and we'll come back to, you know, these new rules. Uh, but I wanted to, at least for one week, go over some credit reporting errors. And, and here's the way I'm envisioning it. I'm just going to take, you know, actual uh excerpts from credit reports that that I have. Obviously, I'll re redact the account number and things like that. And what I want to do is put them on the screen and then say, okay, let's go through together. Let's find the errors. Let's find the things that are wrong, the missing information, the contradiction. So I'll give you an example. And, and this is pretty frequent uh, that, that we see this. So Equifax is the only bureau that will give you what's called the date of first delinquency, okay? That's the first time you went delinquent that you never recovered from. The other two, Equ or Experian and TransUnion, don't provide that. They're supposed to, but they don't. But we'll see on there, it will say, date of first delinquency, January 2020. Okay. And then you go to the payment history on Equifax, and you look for January 2020, and what does it say? Perfect. Okay, current. Well, how can I be okay? How can I be current if that's the date I went delinquent? Okay. And, you know, we've talked about this in other videos. 
you know, it says 60 days and then 120 days. Well, how can I be 60 and then 120? There's not enough days to do that. Okay. So it won't be so much on, you know, what exactly are errors. I mean, it's just, we're looking for stuff that's incomplete or just inaccurate. So we're not even really talking about the law. We're just saying, all right, on this credit report, either compared to itself, so TransUnion to itself or TransUnion to Equifax and Experian, what are the inaccuracies? What are the inconsistencies? What are the contradictions? And then the other part is, then I'll, you know, we'll kind of all make notes of that. And then I'll just open up a Word document and we'll start typing it. Like, how would we describe these errors? Because what I realized when I did the, the five or six part series on fixing your own credit reports is that I didn't spend enough time actually showing like, how do we write the dispute letter? I gave you templates. And, and if you guys missed any of that, just let me know, but templates and we talked about it, but how do you sort of put pen to paper, you know, fingers to keyboard to say, all right, for example, TransUnion has, um, has September and they have information there. But October's missing, November's missing, and then they have December. So what wh what would we say about that? Well, we just type in there. Hey, you're missing the the balance, the schedule payment, the the past due, the actual amount paid, the rating, whatever it is for whatever. I can't remember my months now. I think I said October, November. You know, supply this information or delete the whole account. Okay, or they say. Um, that th this is pretty common one. So it will say, we paid off the account January, 2020. Great. We pay it off. It was a charge off account. It's been closed. We paid it January, 2020. And then February, they put the rating as charge off. How can I be charged off in February when I paid it in January? So, you know, sometimes people say, well, how do I word that in a fancy way? There's no fancy way. You literally say, uh, how can I be charged off in February when I paid this? You guys put the date I paid it. You say it's paid in full. You say the account's closed. How can I possibly be charged off in February when I paid it in January? That makes no sense to me. I mean, we literally write that. And I want you to see that because doing dispute letters is pretty easy actually, but sometimes we make it harder than it should be. And sometimes folks in the industry make it harder than it should be in large part to say, come to me, you know, I, I'm the only one that can do it. No, I want you to learn how to do it yourself. And so you can do your own disputes because nobody can do them better than you. Okay. And then they're going to, they're going to fix it, delete it, or then you can look at suing if they don't do that. So that's what we'll do next week. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. It may be the best possible webinar. It may be a disaster. I don't know. I'll have to kind of figure out how we're going to do all this, but that's my plan to do that. And then, uh, you know, if you guys are interested, we can do that again, or we can switch back to these new rules or, you know, another topic. So I want these weekly webinars to be, um, you know, w things that you guys are interested in. And I have gotten some questions about this, limited content message. And so that's why I wanted to cover it today. So uh, any final thoughts or questions before we wrap up? I think we actually may be early today. Usually I have a tendency to go way too long. So uh, let's see. Tony says, let's do it again. Thanks so much. You're very welcome, Tony. Thanks for being here. And uh, Jeff says, great idea for next week. So yeah, I, I hope you guys can be here. Obviously, if you can't be here live, like I I couldn't be here live last week either. Uh, you'll get a replay link, but uh, particularly next week. And what I'd like to do with these is to make them as sort of as interactive as we can. So it's not just, you know, listening to me drone on, which will probably put you asleep, but instead uh, say, well, let's think about this. You know, uh, like I forget, uh, Jeff asked the question, you know, what if they put the reference number? That's a great question. Let's think about that. You know, would that violate the law? Would it not violate the law? And uh, if you see any collectors on your credit report or you get any collection letters, just sort of stop for a moment as a mental exercise and say, if they left me one of these supposed limited content messages and they left their business name, would that violate the law? And just sort of practice that. So oh, let's see, Jones says, 
good info provided. So thank you, Joe. And uh, you guys have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week, fabulous weekend. And I will see you guys next Thursday. So uh, I will sign off here and y'all have a good one. Okay, see ya.